great to be here this morning to worship with you, and I hope you guys came to worship because that's what we're here to do this morning. The first song we're going to sing this morning, it says, worthy of every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever Stand together and uh, just sing these songs out to God. Let's sing together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you jesus the name above every other name jesus the only one who could ever save out together I will build my life and I
is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me holy there is no one like you there is none beside Amen. That's our prayer this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. What wonderful words with your heart and lead me. Open up my eyes to those around me. Uh, we're, we're gathered together as the body of Christ because this is the way God manifests himself to us. God shows himself through the body of Christ. And so it's not just about coming together to worship. It's about experiencing Christ in and with one another. And, and, and that allows us to lift our hearts up, allows us to put our baggage aside, our distractions out the door, and focus on the one who calls us to be his family of faith. I want to welcome you to worship today. And if this is your church home, or if it's your first time, our hope and our prayer is that you'll encounter the transforming power and grace and presence of Jesus Christ as we worship him together. We hope that you'll encounter the love of this family of faith great group of folks and if you happen to uh, be a newcomer one of our guests we'd love to put a gift in your hands and Peggy is holding an example of a welcome gift and she will be located outside the foyer at the welcome center and we want to bless you with that welcome gift if you've not received one of those please introduce yourself to Peggy and uh, let us get to know you and bless you with that gift let's continue now to worship as we bless our Lord through our singing through our prayer and our praise sing this out together this morning. There's a power that's made perfect in my weakness. Fills me up with a strength that is fearless. I find hope within your everlasting promise. It fans my faith into flame.
make this be your prayer this morning and your truth. No darkness can stand against this brighter glory. His promise is sure. Jesus decides my story. No darkness can stand against this brighter glory. No promise is sure. Jesus decides my story. the fire burning inside of me. I'm living for the same Jesus eternally. With all that I am, Lord, I give you my heart. So let the flame shine brighter. Let your praise sing lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh is free indeed I'm a child of God and yes I Sing it out. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. 
Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this week we celebrated those we love. We gave gifts of chocolates and flowers and cards to remind those around us of our love for them. But our love is not confined to one day, and we should be reminding those around us of our love for them throughout the year. The same is true with you, Lord. May we remember your love for us. Your word tells us that your love for the world is so great that you sent Jesus so that whoever believes will have eternal life. Your love is eternal. It is never ending. It is not contingent on whether or not we deserve it. You love us because that is your character. It is who you are. And for that, we are so grateful. In response to your love, we come before you declaring our love for you. We come bearing our offerings of praise and worship. May we not forget to always be appreciative for what you have done for us. And this morning, God, we don't wanna forget the various prayer requests we come with. We offer all of our requests and lay them at your feet. We know you hear our prayers for healing and strength, solutions and understandings. Lord, hear our prayers. And during this month, as well, we want to remember and pray for our brothers and sisters of color. We pray for the injustices in our nation and around the world. Help us to stand alongside our brothers and sisters and make this world a better, safer place for all. God, we also ask that you use us to be your hands and your feet to reach out to those not here today. May they not feel forgotten this morning. And now, God, we join our voices with those praying all over the world as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture tells us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has our sin been cast from us. This is the good news of the gospel today, my friends. Believe it. hope you guys had a great Valentine's weekend and maybe you're still celebrating maybe you haven't yet maybe you're not gonna celebrate but that's okay um, but uh, you know I'm looking at this next song is how great is your love and we just talked about love a little bit here and uh, next door our children right now are going through a series called love and they're talking about how Jesus loves them and how they encounter Jesus every day and uh, it's the same with us you know no matter where we're at in life what we're going through or uh, if we don't feel like anyone loves us, you're wrong. Jesus loves us, all right? He's always there. He's there for us right now. And uh, this song just talks about how, how God sent his son Jesus into the world, came down from heaven to earth and lived among us and died for us, died for each one of you, you and me. And uh, we're going to sing How Great Is His Love. So this morning as we sing this out and we sing to him, just remember how much God loves us, how great is his love for us, 
and may it change you this morning. Maybe you haven't really concentrated on the words a whole lot, and really it's pretty simple, but uh, it's so powerful. And I just hope that this morning as we sing this out that you'd encounter God in a new way. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out, lifted me up How great is your love You bore my weakness, you took my shame Buried my burden in fields of grace you called me out lifted me up how great is your love from the heights of heaven you stepped down to earth in a sin perfection gave your life for us and we are amazed yes we stand in awe for we have been changed by the power of the cross how great how great how great is your love how great how great how great is your stand together as we sing. In your kindness, you lead me home. In your presence, where I belong, you called me out, lifted me up. How great is your So 
God, you are so good. You are so powerful. You are so great. You are so mighty. And most of all, you love us. Lord, we can't thank you enough for that. We thank you so much for coming to this world to die for each one of us so we can have life through you. And we just can't stop praising you this morning for that. I ask this morning as we continue to worship you that you would just continue to meet with us like you already have. Be with Pastor Tim, and may you just continue to speak through him this morning, and may you speak to each one of us. And we pray this in your great name. Amen. If you would, look around the room this morning, maybe spot someone that you don't know and say, hey, my name is... If you're a Christian, I'm sure you want a life of the greatest impact. I know I do. But I had to learn that to have that kind of life, it was necessary to learn to play spiritual defense along with spiritual offense. You may not realize it, but I bet that you or someone you know has a toxic person in their life, keeping you from the joy and the peace, but also the spiritual ministry that God wants you to do. When I found myself running up against the wall time and time again, a wise and loving friend of mine pointed out to me how often in the book of Luke, Jesus was willing to walk away from those toxic people or let others walk away from him when the situation was unproductive. One of the reasons we need to learn how to play spiritual defense is to avoid one of Satan's most clever traps against the work of God's church. If you're a believer, you can't stop caring. The Holy Spirit within you compels you to love and to want to reach as many people as possible. Satan knows this. So what he decides to do is to take that love that God gives to us. We could call it that pure water of God flowing through us to, to nurture and to meet the thirst of so many others. And instead of that water going out into fields to fertilize them and create an abundant harvest, he wants to get us to pour that loving water straight down the gutter into the lives of toxic people who not only will never be changed, they'll resent us for even offering it. And when to walk away, we're gonna talk about how we know we're in a toxic situation. What are the markers of a toxic personality? How do we respond, whether we're at work, whether we're at church, or even more at home? Why it's important to be honest about the toxicity we're facing and how we can understand from the life of Jesus when exactly to walk away. I got my connect card. Good morning, everybody. That video is from the uh, Wednesday night Bible study that's starting this Wednesday right here at 645 on the 19th. We encourage you all to sign up can get a uh, study guide on Amazon. I imagine since everybody has their phone on and it's listening, they now know that we need like 35 of them and they'll be here tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so here's the Connect card. Don't forget about this. If you're new, I encourage you to fill one out. Uh, for all first-time sign-ups, Family Promise will be, uh, get a donation of $5 in your name. So it's important that you sign these up. If you have any interest in participating in the production or anything like that, you can put that information on here as well. The, um, the church is 100% independent financially. Everybody is, uh, all, all our tithes, uh, your tithes and offering are what support our ministries here. And there's four ways to give. 
before. Not before. Uh, that's, you can donate at the back of the chapel in the offering box. You can donate through your online banking system. You can do it through one of the uh, phone apps, and you can also do it through the SEC website. You go to stewartcongregationalchurch.com, and you can uh, donate there. The, um, there's uh, s uh, some great Bible study opportunities this week, the growth s step that's uh, up there on, on in front of us. We've got the Men's Disciple Cafe, which is Tuesdays at 7.30 at Osceola Street Cafe. Um, the Women of Faith, that's at uh, Wednesdays at 10 a.m., and that's here at the uh, chapel. Uh, Wednesday Family Night, which I just mentioned, that's the uh, the new sermon series, or the, the uh, uh, talked When to Walk Away series. And the Mission Women's uh, Thursday at, is that, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on, 6.15 p.m. here at the, at the church. And uh, lastly, I encourage you all to sign up for the Realm system. If, uh, if you haven't received an email, you can need to contact Brenda at the, uh, in the church office, and she'll get you set up on that. But uh, that's a great way to connect. It's uh, kind of an automated version of the Connect card. So I encourage you all to uh, get ready to encounter God's Word. Good morning again. It is uh, a joy to move through this series. We are in, our, I think, our fourth week, and ne next week will be the last of, of the series. As we bring it all to a close and kind of capture everything we've been saying, uh, it is our 2020 vision series, and today we'll talk about a vision to live and what that's all about. But let's, let's sort of collect our hearts together for a moment of prayer before we do that. Let's pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come like fire and burn. Come like wind and cleanse. Come like light and reveal. Convict, convert, consecrate until we are wholly yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We heard Chuck refer to the steps in front of you. This has been our sermon prop our object lesson for the last several weeks, three steps. It's a simple, a simple illustration of what we call three steps to spiritual maturity. That's right. We're trying to make it as simple as possible. That's simply three steps. Simple, but not necessarily easy. Simple, but all-encompassing, comprehensive of your whole life. This is about regular worship, step one. Regular growth. So regular worship in the body of Christ, not just in your own devotions. Regular growth in a group, not just your own quiet time. And regular service using your spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ and to reach the world in His name. Those are the three steps to spiritual maturity. And last week we talked about how uh, a life of generosity is a result of living this out. Uh, you just happen to, you, you can't help but be a generous person when you're encountering God, growing in Jesus, and when you're serving through the power of the Holy Spirit. It simply is who you are. And today, we're going to talk about how a, a vision to live is really what captures all of this. It's about authentic and meaningful relationships in the body of Christ. It's not just steps. Relationships are what it's all about. And this is so very important. And, and I'm going to ask you a question that I know some of you can relate to and why it's so important. Do you know that you can be in a room like this with a group of people, you can be in a crowd and still feel alone? You can still feel alone in a crowd of people. There's an example of this. It was a monastery. They live in community in a monastery, a group of monks who were together, and they had to take a vow of silence, a vow of silence, except that every 10 years, they were given the opportunity to say two words. And so 10 years passes, and this monk comes before the head monk, 
And he says, uh, all right, you get your two words. And the monk says, bed hard. I see, says the head monk. Ten years of silence goes by again. He gets his next two words after now 20 years, right? And he says, food stinks. I see, says the head monk. Another 10 years passes. He's invited to say another two words, and he says, I quit. <laughs> to which the head monk says, well, it's no surprise because all you ever do is complain. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's a joke, obviously. Um, but it's this idea that you can live in community but be disconnected from others, and that's not God's design. That's not God's intention. And this is a, a really important topic because look at this headline that I found, and this is sobering and should catch your attention. Loneliness, a new epidemic in the USA. You know, we're, we're, you hear about coronavirus, and you hear about flu, and you hear about things that are going on, uh, viral diseases. Loneliness, a new epidemic. Why is that? Almost half of Americans identify with feeling lonely in one way. Here's some statistics, actually. There's kind of prove it. Research and surveys were done that show that 40% of people feel alone, 47% feel left out, 27% uh, feel like they are not understood, 43% say that their relations are not meaningful, and 43% feel isolated. You know how we have generational categories, you know, Generation X, Generation Z, the Millennial Generation, all of those? Of all the generations, the one that researchers are saying feels the most alone is Generation Z. That's our teenagers. That's our teenagers. Do you think for that reason it's really important that we invest in youth ministry? That whatever you can do to support and be invested in youth ministry, whether you're a parent encouraging your children to be part of it, or whether you're an adult who can pour into it, be a mentor, be a part of the team in some sense, it's so, so desperate, really. Relationships are so very important. In fact, medical science is telling us how important it is on a health level. The American Institute of Stress did research on 232 patients who had been through cardiac surgery, heart surgery, and they found something astounding. The, the top two predictions of mortality after having cardiac heart surgery, they're, they're not lacking exercise or eating poorly or smoking or drinking. You'd think that might be it. You know what they are? The top two predictors of mortality are these. A lack of participation in social or community groups and the absence of strength and comfort from religion. In other words, you're more likely to die after heart surgery by being disconnected from others and disconnected from God. Relationship. You're more likely to die from that than you are smoking or eating poorly or not exercising. How crazy is that? And someone jokingly said, so if you're going to smoke, at least do it with others. <laughs> it's all about relationships. My, uh, when I was graduating from college, you know how you have a mentor sometimes, and they say something, and it crystallizes? There's just one little thing this guy, his name was Reed. He knew I was graduating from college, and I was, I was looking to go into seminary. You know, I was going to study theology and enter into ministry and a career and the institution of the church and so on and so forth. And he said one little sentence, and it stuck with me all of these years, since 1988. He said, Tim, remember, it's all about relationships. That's it. That's it. In other words, he was saying, don't get caught up in the diploma and the degrees on what's hanging on your wall. Don't get caught up in the position. Don't get caught up in the authority. Don't get caught up in the trappings of what you do and accomplishes accomplishments and making things happen and the organization and all of this. And you don't have to be a minister for this to be the case, right? In any position that you're in, you can get caught up in all that stuff, the trappings. And it was so simple, yet so profound. He said, remember, it's all about relationships. What's most important about anything you're doing is not what you're doing. The relationships are what's most important in anything you're about. That's what he was saying, and he's so right. And so when you look at these steps, worship, grow, serve, worship, grow, serve, 
is not a program or a checklist, but rather a lifestyle of connecting with one another, of living life together. It's how we do life together. It's sharing our dreams and joys, our burdens and losses. It's about growing and maturing together, not in isolation. It's about knowing one another well enough so that you know what to celebrate in somebody's life. And, and, and you know the burdens to pray for in someone's life. Nothing worse than being in a group. And you've got something really awesome going on, but nobody knows. And no one, therefore, is celebrating with you. Or some really deep pain, and no one knows. And so no one's walking with you and holding you through this. It's about caring for one another. One of my uh, colleagues, a pastor, actually up in the Melbourne area, he, he taught me a little bit about this with his small group network that he had in his church, a, a series of small groups that met for Bible study and prayer and gathering and fellowship together, just like this picture depicts. And he said, you know, the amazing thing about our small groups is that they're building relationships in such a way, they're caring for one another, praying for one another, and whenever one of them goes into the hospital or has a deep need like that, they will beat me every time to the hospital to see them. And he said, that's the way it should be in the church. Think of it this way. Do you just want someone who's a professional, who's paid to care for you doing so? Or do you want it to be natural, organic, authentic? People who've been walking with you, celebrating with you, praying for you, caring for you all along the way to simply be there because that's what friends do. You see, that's God's design for us. That's what it's meant to be. We should not ever isolate ourselves away from that and that is the tendency especially in the American church I had a very interesting conversation a couple of weeks ago with uh, the adult son and daughter-in-law of some of our church members their names are Robert and Ag Agnes Hooker Agnes Hooker and um, they live in China she's Chinese he's American but met her and married her in China and they live and work there they're Christians and so I wanted to ask them about what life is like in China as a Christian. And, and, and amidst all the questions I asked, I, I asked a question and the answer was really surprising to me. And tell me if it surprises you. I said, what's the majority religion in China? And I thought they'd come back with, you know, Buddhism or Taoism or something like that. Do you know what Robert told me the majority religion is in China? You'll never guess. He said it's self-serving pragmatism. Isn't that interesting? Self-serving pragmatism. What's pragmatic? That serves yourself. That's what it's all about. He said, in other words, for Chinese people, if you ask them, what do you believe in? They'll say, I believe in myself. In fact, the textbooks, he said, the very textbooks in China say, there is no God, it's up to you. That's a quote. There is no God, it's up to you. Everything's about you and what you make of your life, and you're disconnected from others. Good luck. Now, there's a subculture in China that's contrary to that larger culture in the underground church of China. You see, the Chinese Communist Party will come in and they will break up non-sanctioned churches that they are not sanctioning. They'll break them up and they'll often arrest people. But those churches are not intimidated and they don't go away. You know why? You can guess by now, can't you? Relationships. They're connected in deep and authentic and meaningful ways. They just go dark. They go underground. They're called the underground church. And I said, well, so in a communist system, how do they communicate in order to know when and where to meet and what to do? Because they're monitoring all the communications, right? He said, they have code words, and everyone knows the code words. Code words for church, code words for Bible study, code words for worship and they all meet together I have a slide I think that depicts one of these groups meeting covertly in a home group hiding away from the government officials and when he began to describe that to me I began to compare what life is like for them compared to you and me here in an American church my friends, we take so, so, so for granted our freedom to be able to worship and grow 
and serve and join together on a regular basis. And yet they are desperate to do so and have to do it in covert ways at risk of being put in prison as a result. You see, the first Christians who existed, the very first Christians who existed, are actually a whole lot more like the Chinese underground church than they are our church, most American churches. You see, they didn't take for granted joining together. It wasn't just one option among many like it so often is for us. The early church knew the value and the importance of doing life together. They knew the value and the importance of living in community, of investing in one another. It was so very important. In fact, we have a brief description of it in the book of Acts in the second chapter, and I want to read this to you. It, it is a snapshot in five or six verses of what it was like to live together in the church, to be the church, to connect in relationships that are meaningful and to promote your relationship with one another and God. And this is what Luke wrote in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. He says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. How, how did those first Christians live their lives together? The, 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 the very opening of it, which is repeated again, and we'll get to that in a minute, is devotion. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to one another through worship together, meeting in the temple courts, worshiping together on a regular basis. They devoted themselves through growing together. That is, learning the scriptures, the apostles teaching, the apostles learning and teaching God's word. They devoted themselves to one another through serving together. You heard the reference of doing miracles and miraculous signs God working in their midst through their gifts. Uh, they were devoted to one another through giving together. They sold property and possessions and gave to those in need. What a generous spirit, a, gen a lifestyle of generosity that flowed out of worshiping and growing and serving. They were devoted to one another through living life together. The word is fellowship. You notice that it said that they were... Not only at the temple courts worshiping, they were in homes together, breaking bread, they were sharing meals together. You see what this is a picture of? It's a picture of doing life together. It's not a program. It's not a checklist. It's about, about being invested in one another's lives together. This is the vision to live. A vision to live is about belonging. That's what they're depicting. The word for belonging is fellowship. That's kind of a churchy word. The Greek word is koinonia. It's about belonging together. Everyone wants to belong in meaningful places with others, doing meaningful things with others. God does not want you or me to settle for simply believing in him, for faith being just a head trip. Rick Warren put it this way, you're called to belong, not just believe. So often we just relegate faith to just being an, a, an affirmation of faith, something that we believe, but we're not connected more deeply than my wife was actually illustrating this with some people who are in one of her Bible studies, the Mission Women's Bible study on Thursday nights. And one of the ladies came to the Bible study and she said, You know, I love our Bible study and I love the content, but I'm really not here as much for that as I am for the relationships. To be able to hold hands with you and pray, to be able to share joys and concerns, to know that I'm lifted up, to be able to connect in meaningful ways and to do life with you is what makes it so much richer. My friends, this is the opportunity for all of us that God wants us to embrace and not settle for less. When we worship, grow, and serve together, we shape a lifestyle of authentic relationships, and we make space for belonging together. Now, you can do life on your own, and a lot of Christians do. Just kind of 
plod through on their own. But that's not why God created you and me. That's clear in Scripture. Listen, you and I were created and redeemed by Jesus to be family, to be the family of God, for relationships with others and God. Remember my friend who said to me, Tim, remember, it's all about relationships. Horizontal with one another. Vertical with God. They go together. You don't even have to be religious or read the Bible to get this, do you? A, a lady is at the post office to buy stamps, of all things. We all go to the post office and buy stamps, right? She's standing in the line for the counter, and the person behind her hears that she's buying stamps, and, and this person says, you know you can go outside to the foyer, the lobby, and there's a machine where you can get as many stamps as you want, and not stand in line, it's quick, and you're out of here. And she said, yeah, I know that, but... That machine in the lobby, it can't ask me how I'm doing with my arthritis. See, we have this innate desire to connect with our hurts and our joys with other people. There are no substitutes for that. Even a three-year-old girl knows this. Little Lori was a three-year-old, and her daddy and she were talking, and he said, okay, it's bedtime. You need to go you know, take your clothes off and put your pajamas on, and and she said, well, Dad, I need you to help me. Um, and he said, well, you don't need my help. You know how to do this. And this is what she said to him. Daddy, sometimes people need people anyway, even though they know how to do things by themselves. Isn't that cute? Sometimes, even though we're able to get stamps out of a machine, even though we're able to do things for ourselves, guess what? We need people anyway. We need one another. And that's why that phrase, one another, is one of the most popular phrases in the New Testament. In fact, it's used 100 times. The Greek word is alelon, alelon. And, and Paul uses it in his letters to the churches 60% of the time. We are meant for one another. This is not a solo, lone ranger enterprise. And so the way that this phrase, one another, is used for Christians can be broken down into three various uses. And here they are. Either unity, love, or humility. One third of these one another texts uh, emphasize the unity of the body of Christ so that we're not divided or divisive with one another. Let me give you some examples of various scriptures that represent the unity side of one another. Be at peace with one another. Don't grumble among one another. Be of the same mind with one another. Accept one another. Wait for one another before in, uh, beginning the Eucharist. Don't bite, devour, and consume one another. Don't boastfully challenge or envy one another. Gently, patiently tolerate one another. Be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving to one another. Bear with and forgive one another. Seek good for one another and don't repay evil for evil. Don't complain against one another. Confess sins to one another. All of these are meant to be ways for us to unify, to be one together. But then there's the expression of love. And it's very clear and very simple the way it's often expressed. For instance, love one another. There are about eight different passages that say that. Through love, serve one another. Tolerate one another in love. Greet one another with a kiss of love. You've got to be a little careful with that one. Um, be devoted to one another in love. So unity and love and then humility. This idea, 15% of these one another texts stress humility and deference in relationships. Here are some sample verses. Give preference to one another in honor. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Serve one another. Wash one another's feet. Don't be haughty. Be of the same mind. Be subject to one another. Clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. This one anothering as it's called, is the essence of building relationships. You can't one another by yourself, can you? You can't remove yourself and make faith a solo enterprise, a solo project, and one another. But like so many things that we encounter that are good in life, we have to look at roadblocks and hurdles, don't we? If you're on a diet, or if you're trying to exercise more, you've got to look at the habits that keep you from doing that, right? And so I've identified at least three different roadblocks to the one anothering and to belonging. And here they are. 
One is addiction to yourself. Two is spiritual independence. And three is social media. Addiction to yourself. You ever thought about that? Donald Miller talked about this in a wonderful book called Blue Light Jazz. And in his book, Blue Light Jazz, he, uh, he talks about living in community for the first time. And this is what he said about it, his experience. He said, living in community made me realize one of my faults. I was addicted to myself. All I thought about was myself. The only thing I really cared about was myself. I had very little concept of love, altruism, or sacrifice. I discovered that my mind is like a radio that picks up only one station, the one that plays me, K-Don, Don all the time. And then he went on to say something very sobering. He said, I had to contend with the major lie that I was telling myself, and that is that life is all about me. We all struggle with different things that we're addicted to in some way or another. Some are addicted to pornography. Some are addicted to shopping. Some are addicted to gambling. Some to drugs. Some to alcohol. Some to relationships. But I want to suggest to you that more people in this room and in any gathering like this are addicted to themselves than to anything else. Living life so self-focused and so self-serving that we disconnect from one another in meaningful ways unless it serves us. That's what it means to have an addiction to yourself. You can't get past that unless you're engaging in the lives of others in meaningful ways. One of the uh, Bible studies that uh, is happening in a couple weeks, Mark Nygaard is putting together a Bible study for 30s and 40s, beginning on the 24th of February. And they'll be engaging in the same material we're starting on Wednesday nights. A great opportunity for some of you who are in that age range. I'm too old. So addiction to yourself, that's one of the roadblocks. The second one is spiritual independence. A lot of times this comes back to spiritual pride. The more you grow in God's word, the more self-sufficient you feel. The more Jesus and me you get. You ever heard that phrase, Jesus and me? But faith is not just about you and Jesus. Rick Bazette, the pastor who wrote a book called Be Real, and he said this, sometimes we try to justify our Lone Ranger mindset by Christianizing it with Scripture. We may say, all I need is God. That's really all I need. I just need the Lord. Well, the problem with that is that if you look at the very scriptures, you don't find any examples of that. You don't find any teaching about that. They're always written to community and for community. It's a corporate word where we find our identity and our faith as we join together and pour into one another's lives, as we study and worship and grow and serve together. That's the only model you find in scripture. There is no Lone Ranger approach. So spiritual independence can be a serious roadblock. How do you get past it? Well, by joining your lives and linking your hearts with others. And then the third one, social media. This is a big one. It's increasingly so. It's not just for younger generations. It's for all of us. Think about how much screen time you have in a given day or a given week versus how much face-to-face, knee-to-knee, Time you have with other people because see, a screen social media you can't hear the intonation of someone's voice can you you can't see the look on their face or in their eyes you you can't you can't sense their body posture and what it is they're feeling that's not being said you can't do that through social media in other words social media is not so social it's a poor substitute for authentic relationships. Rick Bazette said this, social media has become social mediocrity. Isn't that a good phrase? We need to challenge ourselves about this, guys. Because we often say, well, I don't have time for this to gather with this group or that group. How much time do you spend on social media? It is a poor substitute for true social interaction, for true authentic relationships. Remember, he told me, it's all about relationships first Christians didn't have to deal with any of these roadblocks addiction to themselves that was not an issue spiritual independence well that was certainly not an issue they, they it was it was like the Chinese churches their lives depended on being bound together and they didn't have social media to worry about let me depict this one more time in verse 46 in Acts chapter 2 I want, I want to highlight this I'm just gonna read the first half of this verse and this is what Luke records in verse 46. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I want to stop there. Every day they continued to meet together. That phrase, continued to meet together, is two Greek words. I'm going to teach you a little New Testament Greek. Two Greek words for continued to meet together. And here are the Greek words. Proskar torontes and homothumadon. Proskar torontes. It, uh, it really means devoting themselves, and homothumadon means with one mind. Now look at how different that is from the translation that's in front of us in the New International Version of the Bible. Continuing to meet together doesn't quite give the impact and the quality of relationship as does devoting themselves with one mind together. Do you see the difference there? There was a sense of devotion to one another. And that we're losing our individuality in some sense because we're being bound together, unified by God as one. In other words, who I am is bigger than who I am when we are together. Devoting themselves with one mind. The first church showed you and me how to have single-minded devotion to our Lord and to one another. Single-minded devotion to our Lord and to one another. They taught us to love others because God does. They taught us the importance of doing life together, to belong and not just believe. They taught us faith is about relationships with God and one another. It's not a head trip. They taught us about the importance of unity and love and humility as a church. They taught us a vision to live as God intended. Thanks be to him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you gave us the church. And not just this church, but churches that go back to the very beginning of the first century. And churches like those in China that are so much like them that remind us of how desperately we need one another how we need to be invested in one another's lives inviting each other in connecting our hearts together sharing our joys as well as our burdens walking with one another so that we might live life in an authentic way with you and others Lord we prayed at the beginning of this sermon for your Holy Spirit to convict us or to convert us. We ask that you would do that so that we might come to you as we come together with one another. And to you be the honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.
sometimes we just need Jesus with skin on again, don't we? That's really what we've been talking about. And we need other people. We always need other people on a regular basis. But if today, if there's a special need going on and and you need someone to walk with you and pray with you through something, maybe there's a burden you have for someone else, whatever it might be, we invite you to meet with one of our Stephen ministers. Sandy Coy will be right over here next to the piano. And Sandy would love to pray with you and walk with you and be a sounding board for you. Don't hesitate if you feel that need, if you feel the Spirit nudging you to come forward after the service and see Sandy for a moment of prayer. And I encourage you, if you are in the 30s and 40s age range, I'm not, I'm too old, uh, Mark is going to start this new Bible study just for you guys on Monday the 24th, Monday the 24th at 6 o'clock over in the, the building next door called the Next Gen Center. So mark that down and see him if you have questions about that. And so, beloved, let me charge you with the words of Scripture, and that is this. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, remember to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. May the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's children said... Amen. Yeah, he loves. 